I don't think this works. See, I have to wear glasses in order to read, but I wear sunglasses in order to block the sun. Sooner or later, I'm going to get my reading sunglasses back, and then I'll be happy. <laughs> but in the meantime, I have to be careful, because if I get too much sun, I got skin cancer, you know, so I can get that all messed up again. So I have to be a little careful about how much I get in the sun unless I put on all my sunblock. You know, it's kind of like the shield of faith. Nowadays, you got to put on the sunblock. But um, I was kind of thinking about, you know, I don't know if you're like me, but uh, I like to eat. <laughs> I really like bagels and imperial margarine. Dun, 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 fit for a king. Nobody remembers that commercial. But you see, there are times when, during the week, I kind of eat my bagels and hummus. I really like hummus because it's kind of like a, it's chickpeas. It's kind of like gives me some protein, you know, and kind of spread on my bagel. And it just tastes good. I like it. It's kind of like peanut butter, you know. Bagels and peanut butter are good too, but. You know, that's kind of, for me, that's like a, I don't know, dead of summer thing. And I kind of go through phases, you know, different times I like different things, but... I'll, uh, eat these bagels while I'm doing videos. And it keeps me from getting hungry. Because <laughs> believe me, I can pack away 6,000 calories and not gain any weight. I have this tendency to burn up calories. So I have to kind of remember to eat. Because you see, if I don't eat, I get sleepy. I don't really get hungry, but I get tired. Then don't matter how much coffee I drink, how much Pepsi I drink, I don't do energy drinks too sugary or something. They're so sweet that I, like if I find one that tasted terrible like coffee, <laughs> I'd probably drink energy drinks. But if I don't eat, I wind up having to sleep so that my body can recoup and recover from really the exercise that it does because of all the mental calories that it uses up because mental work is just as tough as physical work sometimes. And I've been to both extremes. You know, I've been like the nerdy, techie person, and I've also been the hard physical laborer. kind of like the hard physical labor. It doesn't take any brains. <laughs> it was always so easy. kind of fun, actually. seems like you always got paid more in some ways. Although I did make quite a bit of money being a nerd. But I made a lot of money being also like safety coordinator and journeyman uh, boilermaker and doing hard physical labor though. I have done hard physical labor where I made no money, like in Oregon, woodcutter. <laughs> no money. No, no money. <laughs> but in all those jobs, It was very important that I eat. If I didn't eat, I really couldn't do the job. Couldn't get my work done. Then I'd have to kind of stop whatever I was doing. Take a break, either eat or relax. But you know, I can't share these unless I eat. No, I mean spiritually now. I don't mean physically. Of course I can't do it if I don't eat spiritually or physically because my body would just fade away. I get kind of like, kind of dopey and goofy and kind of like, yeah, sleepy. Then I go take a nap. But if I don't study, if I don't read the Bible, if I don't spend time with God, then at first, you know, it's kind of like I could do the videos, I could do, you know, like internet work, I could, you know, accomplish some things, but 
It's kind of like going through quicksand. It's kind of like, you know, it just isn't smooth. It isn't as fun. It isn't as enjoyable. It isn't like sitting here on a warm summer day, letting the sun beat on me and warm me up, watch my cherry tomatoes grow. There's a little, three little cherry tomatoes on there. Remember when we first started Vidivo and we watched these little tiny tomato plants grow? Guess what? This is going to be a beefy tomato and the other one's going to be a hearty tomato. Something like that. But my little cherry tomatoes have already got three little tomatoes growing. Man, and it's only April. <laughs> don't you love California? <laughs> No? Oh, okay. I don't blame you. Neither do I. But I can't talk my wife into moving yet. I've been talking to God for a while now, but oh well. I happen to love this place that we lived in, so because I love it here, it's like, well, I may be stuck for a while. God blessed us with this, I call it my Bethel. This apartment that's more like a home than, than most apartments. <laughs> than, I should say, this apartment that's more like a home than most homes are. And I've got a deck that goes forever. Man, amazing. But you know, God gives us every day the opportunity to direct our lives any way we want to. He'll bring sunshine one day and He'll bring rain another. He'll bring wind one day and He'll bring clouds another. He'll bring everything we really need for life. And it's really up to us to participate in that process we call living. We can choose to fight against it. We can choose to go against, you know, the weather. Like, you know, build your house, you know, in in Arctic Alaska, you know, and build it, you know, six layers thick, you know, and keep a massive heater and power plant inside so that you can live and exist inside. Because if you go outside, you got to put on first your, you know, skin layer that's next to your skin so that it takes all the sweat off you. Then your next layer that's kind of absorbent layer that kind of absorbs the sweat that comes off the skin layer that that way it doesn't get the wetness onto your skin so you don't chill yourself. And then you have another layer after that that's kind of like the outer layer of your warmth and then you have to have your actual physical outer layer that keeps the wind chill off and the cold and the snow and the water and the moisture. And you know, you gotta have your first set of gloves, you know, kind of like skin tight, you know, that keeps everything wicking and warm and, you know, kind of compressed. Then you have to have your big outer glove, you know, to cover it because, you know, when you get into 40 below with 60 mile an hour winds, you don't want to be having anything exposed, you know. You don't want your face exposed, so you got your, you know, little face thing on, and you got your hoodie, you know. It's kind of, well, it's not really a hoodie, but it's more like a, a tunnel vision thing. You know, kind of sticks out and you got to kind of block so that the wind kind of blows it sideways, you know, and you kind of do one of those things. But, you know, you could fight the weather and live in that kind of climate, and I did. But, you know, cooperating with where God wants you to be, it's a lot easier than fighting against where you're supposed to be. Because as much as I enjoy being in that kind of weather, God brought me here. Now, if I kind of decided to take a quick plane trip to Nome. It might be warm right now, so actually April? No, <laughs> not yet. Might be warm in the sun, but I'd freeze to death. It'd be cold. My blood's not prepared for it. It's not thickened up. You know, I'm not back in my Alaska mentality, you know. I'm not there, you know. I may be panning for gold, but I'm not there. But today, where I'm at, the way I'm at. I sat down, had a bagel and butter, and kind of enjoyed it, you know. Kind of like the fact that as long as I eat, and as long as I take in something sustenance wise, God can use me in a positive way to inspire other people to maybe read their Bible and eat spiritually, as well as maybe, you know, like listen to some audio Bible somewhere. You know, there's a really good, matter of fact, one of the best series I've ever heard taught as just a reading of the Bible. And it's called the One Year Audio Bible. And uh, Billy Graham recommended it. And it's done by a guy named Tom Dooley. And he reads these little s snippets of the One Year Bible. But he comments on it from commentary, you know, that I don't know where he gets his commentary from, but 
man, it's really right on. You know, it's like faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And The only thing I can tell you is that if you don't have faith, you ought to listen to it because you can listen to it each day a different portion, you know, and they read part from the Old Testament, part from New Testament, and I think a psalm. I think it's like psalm or proverb, but, you know, you can listen to it and find out. But um, it's really good. You know, he's got a good voice and just kind of a nice, soft-spoken way of saying it. And it's kind of interesting, you know, is that that kind of ministers to my spirit, kind of encourages me, you know, and kind of gets me ready to be able to bloom, so to speak, where I'm planted, kind of like these plants are, you know, to produce little cherry tomatoes in my life so that maybe people could see that there's some joy in my life. <laughs> if you can't see that, boy, <laughs> you need to come over to my house. Come on over my house to my house. I give you candy and bread or something like that. But, you know, fruit, peace, love, joy, goodness, temperance, kindness, gentleness. You know, I'm sure people wonder about my house sometimes because it seems like whenever I'm recording, I get some kind of loud noise going by. That's just kind of like, you know, a long story. But 90% of the time, it's so quiet here and so peaceful. You don't hear nothing but the birds, you know. At night, you can hear frogs. And I'm in the city, if you can believe that. And you can hear crickets. Frogs and crickets at night. Unbelievable, isn't it? Oh, sure, the other noises come along, but they pass away. So there's times of peace, times of joy, times of rest. Times where basically the fruit just seems to grow and grow. And you know, that's what God wants to do in your life, is He wants you to grow where you are, to bloom where you're planted, to bear fruit in your life right now. He doesn't want you to get ready for it. He doesn't want you to, like, you know, get all structured out, you know, and say, well, someday I'm going to have peace, and someday I'm going to have love, and someday I'm going to have joy. God says, you can have it now. But it may be a little bit of peace. It may be a little tiny cherry tomato. It might be a little bit of bloom. But you know what? It'll grow. Because that's the one thing about life. You can't stop growing. I can tell you today, you, stop growing. And whether you know it or not, you are still growing. You're either growing old, or you're growing up, or you're growing out, or you're growing in, or you're growing one way or another, but you're still growing. <laughs> you grow new skin, they say, like I guess in 24 hours, or maybe it's 72 hours or something. You grow new skin cells, and they kind of like you know shed off, and kind of snake-like. <laughs> can't remember how many hours it is. But the point is, is that based upon all this growing that's going on, you got to take in what the body needs to grow. Kind of like the plant needs water and light and the right measurements, the right amounts, you know, and then it'll just like, poof, grow like crazy. Well, so do you. You need to figure out what it is that you need in your life and accordingly get it in your life. You know, a certain amount of reading, a certain amount of praying, a certain amount of going to church, a certain amount of talking to people or learning from them, or even maybe witnessing. Wow, there's an idea. But always you have to have something in you in order to give out from you. So you got to eat. You got to take in before you can give out. You got to learn before you can talk. You have to develop things in order to be effective. You have to have fruit before you can share fruit. So if you got no peace in your life, don't try to tell people about peace. If you got no love in your life, don't try to tell people about love. Tell people what you do know about. That's all. Just be you. If you're full of anger, say, hey, you know what? I'm full of anger. Me and God, we're working on it. And that's a witness. <laughs> You may not think of it as a good witness or a bad witness, but guess what? It is a good witness. It's a good witness because it's the truth of where you're at, the facts of who you are. You can say, hey, you know what? I'm a sinner saved by grace, and by golly, I know I'm a sinner. <laughs> and that's me. <laughs> Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. 
And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knew my path. He knows the way that I take. When he has tried me and tested me, I shall come forth as gold. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in every generation and all generations. You have been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm and a shadow from the heat. Who is a rock save our God? They shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Uphold me, hold me, according to thy word, that I may live. And let me not be ashamed of my hope that I have in you. Which hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters into that within the veil. That anchor is so cool because, you know, when you feel like you're going to, like, blow it or you have blown it, God still holds your emotions in check. He can hold that anger, that wrath, that frustration, that malice, that, that revenge, that idea of what even now people are doing. You know, they get all worked up and work themselves up to go out and, you know, do something stupid with weapons or guns or, you know, violence when they don't have to. Because it says, with all prayer and supplication, make your request be made known unto God. When I really, you know, like if I get mad enough, you know, I look at my enemies, you know, or I used to. Now I just try to love my enemies and it seems to be pretty easy for me nowadays. But because you love them to death, you know, and they're dying. <laughs> they can't stand it when you love them. It drives them nuts, which I think is the greatest thing in the world. Cool. Let's love them so that they're going crazy. But, you know, Jesus said that. You know, give your enemy a cup of cold water, you know, and you're putting hot, fiery coals on their head. So I used to bless my enemies. I used to give them water. I used to help them out. I used to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to make a friend of that enemy, you know, and I'd give them a cup of cold water, knowing full well that, you know, what I was doing, and uh, I'd watch and see the results. <laughs> well, the results most of the time was that they became my best friend, you know, and I kind of liked them after a while, and it kind of became a different story, you know, and I went, well, Lord, you really screwed that one up, didn't you? <laughs> But you know, there are other people that I didn't give cold water to, that really I prayed for, and I blessed them as I've left them behind in my my life, and God took revenge, and I felt sorry for them. I almost warned for what they had done to me, that I had gotten so past whatever it was that they thought they had done to me that I didn't even care. You know, it didn't didn't bother me. I was like, well, praise the Lord, you know. Whatever God wants me to learn from it, I'll learn from it. Moved on. Didn't care that they did something to me or that I was in the right or even when I was in the wrong. I didn't defend myself. I didn't assert myself. I didn't tell people anything. I just gave it to the Lord and said, God, I need to let go of this. And I did. And when I did, the fascinating thing was, was that God took up my case and got on their case. And in the years sometimes that went by I would look and see somehow God would bring it to my my remembrance I'd see something in a news article or something somewhere somehow some way it would come across my path and I would remember and sure enough God would be saying to me now Michael see I am your defense I was amazed at that because I know most of you don't know that and you can't keep track of things like that, you know, in order to watch for that in the Lord. But that's what God wanted me to do was to be, to not die, but to declare his works. So that's why he used me in that way to remember those things because he wanted me to tell you that you don't have to defend yourself. You don't have to protect yourself. You don't have to be this kind of person that says, hey, I got to rise to every occasion. You get in my face, I get in your face. You know, you do this, I do that. You know, huh, you know, we get it. You don't have to have an attitude. Your attitude is trust. Because when you trust in the Lord, ooh, you have set heaven and earth against that person. Because the creator of the universe is on your side. Be mindful of that. And let him be the Lord God of all. Because vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. But he won't repay if you make it your way of payback. You don't want payback. You want God to reward them according to their actions. Because you see, a negative action, getting a reward, is a negative response. 
And that negative response is something that just isn't pretty to see, so much so that you'll even feel sorry for your enemy, that they even bothered to touch you when you were serving the living God. Isn't that amazing? Now you know why most people don't defend themselves. It's not that they're wimps. If anything, they're evil and malicious. Okay, maybe not evil, maybe not malicious, but they really are kind of like, get kind of a warped sense of humor where they laugh and they go, ha, you're picking on me? You're picking on me? You think you want to get down on me? Huh, watch what God does to you. Oh man, are you in trouble. Good luck. Goodbye. <laughs> When you take it to the Lord and leave it there, you will pray, Father, forgive them, for they haven't a clue what they're doing. <laughs> and believe me, when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, he saw the tribulation period coming. He knew that God will have his wrath upon the entire world for those things with which they have done to his son. 